Welcome to Mobile One The Grid. Coming up today, we're face to face with the new Toyota TSO 50. And we're on board with the world's fastest Lamborghini. Fire up today's show with a look at Toyota's new LMP1 Challenger in the 2016 World Endurance Championship. A brand new pair of TSO 50s have given Toyota Gazoo Racing the early lead in the WEC manufacturer standings after an action-packed season opener at Silverstone that saw a Porsche pancake and Audi's race-winning car excluded. While rivals faltered, it was a promising start for Toyota, who built their car from the ground up to take on LMP1's big guns. At its unveiling at Circuit Paul Ricard, Anthony Davidson took us through the specifications of the new machine. This is the new uh, Toyota TSO 50. It's the new challenger for this 2016 season. Last year's car was just an evolution of the, the championship winning TSO 40. After the disappointments of last year, we had to scrap it all build a totally new car. So a new hybrid technology going from super capacitor to batteries, going from the, uh, the original V8, uh, normally aspirated engine that started the program in 2012, uh, to the all new V6 turbo engine that we run today. And a brand new chassis, new aerodynamics, and even the steering wheel's new. So uh, only the drivers are the, uh, the, old, the old bits. The radical new bodywork of the TSO 50 will improve aerodynamic performance over the whole car as well as cooling the new powertrain, consisting of the new V6 twin-turbo engine and Toyota's dual-axle energy recovery system, which works under braking and boosts output to a combined 986 horsepower. We're running the front and rear motors to harness the kinetic energy under the braking, so circuits like uh, Le Mans or Bahrain, the real heavy braking circuits lend itself well to this system. They're big motors, they almost weigh as much as me, but that's not much I guess, but <laughs> it's uh, you know one at the front, one at the rear, one at the front does most of your braking to start off with when the load goes forwards, but then you've got the rear motor as well um, to take you deeper into the corner. The TSO 50's predecessor won five out of eight races to win the 2014 championship, but after last season's disappointments, Toyota hoped their new LMP1 hybrid will be competitive for this year's campaign. For us, you know, the World Championship has been won already in 2014. We did a great job that season. We had the fastest, most reliable car, and we want to get back there. And that's why we've had such a fast-tracked approach through the winter, you know, to basically doing six months what we should have been doing over two years, uh, bringing everything together, you know, with a new engine and new battery system. That should have been trickle-fed through one year to the next. But seeing how far back we were last year, we knew that we had to fast track that. So it's been a, a tall order for everybody back at base in Japan and the guys in TMG as well. But you know, you can see the car behind me, they've done it, it's there in the flesh, it goes well, it gives the driver a good feedback behind the wheel, and hopefully it's enough. We're going to keep that new design concept going and we're hoping to uh, mix it with the, uh, the, the finest in LMP1 for this season. We head on to the grid now for the very latest race action. And we begin in Richmond, Virginia at round nine of the NASCAR Sprint Cup. Kevin Harvick got the jump from Paul to lead off the 400 lap race. But all the talk in Richmond was about the return of SHR team boss Tony Stewart, who missed the start of the season through injury. In a long green flag run, Carl Edwards hit the front. Kyle Busch was never far behind. And what would be a race long encounter between the Joel Gibbs teammates. It was Tony Stewart who brought out the caution flags just past mid-distance, slowing with a deflated left rear. A previous restart was the cause of the problem, Joey Logano making the decisive contact with the side of the 14. Brian Scott spin brought out the eighth caution of the day. As the race went green for the final time, Kyle Busch and Carl Edwards left a slowing Kurt Busch behind. It was a straight fight between the Joe Gibbs racing duo. Kyle had led 62 laps of the race, but it's only the last one that counts. 
This is going to be a drag wow. race. Last gasp for three, last lap. Traffic ahead. Kyle Busch, the leader. Look at this. Carl Look at Edwards, this. right Look at there. This. Moves him wow. to win it. Carl <laughs> Edwards, bump and dump and run. Oh, God. How did no. he pull that off? That's a teammate. Oh, you're the fan, dude. You're the fan. I don't know what happened. But that was cool. A second straight win for Edwards and a second straight backflip. Next up, Talladega. More on that later in the show, but we switch to Italy for the opening round of the Blancpain Endurance Series. And after an exciting season opener in the Sprint Series, the endurance racing at Monza didn't disappoint. Dominic Bauman in the number 84 HTP Motorsport Mercedes got the race underway on pole. But it was a traditional hectic monster start with Frank Stittler in the 75 ISR Audi even taking a trip through the gravel. Andy Suchek did well to keep his Bentley Continental GT3 on track after a tap from the Lamborghini. The same couldn't be said minutes later for team partner Bentley, Derek Pierce getting upended from behind by the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. It wasn't a great day for the Kessel Racing Lamborghini either, suffering a spectacular engine failure. A series of pit stops turned out in favour for the 58 McLaren. Rob Bell had been third when coming into the pit lane. But come Ledegar put the McLaren in first position ahead of the Mercedes before handing over to Shane Van Gisbergen. What followed next was GT racing of the highest level. For almost an hour and a half, the duo fought for every inch of Italian tarmac. With Mercedes getting alongside the McLaren on a couple of occasions. The Kiwi Van Gisbergen kept his cool and crossed the line first much to the joy of the recently created Garage 59 team. The car was fantastic, McLaren did a great job, Garage 59 did an absolutely flawless job for their first event, so uh, we're very, very happy. From the racetrack we head into the workshop next to meet the brothers who turn street legal supercars into record-breaking monsters. On a quiet, unassuming industrial estate in Charlotte, North Carolina, is a highly specialized million dollar operation that adds serious horsepower to some of the most aspirational vehicles in the world, Lamborghinis. A normal day at underground racing is anything but normal. We work on cars that people only dream of seeing and we tear them apart to nothing and rebuild them. And on top of that, we add astronomical horsepower to them. To give you a comparison, these cars, when they leave, they make more power than a NASCAR or IndyCar, and they're actually street cars. Brothers Kevin and Casey Howarth received Lamborghinis from all over the world, with more than 50 projects on the go at any one time. The owners all looking for enhancements to their already awesome machines. Our normal street builds go from a thousand horsepower at the wheel to our race builds are, you know, over 2,400 now. What gets the people here is our reputation as far as how we build them, our attention to detail, the true two-year, 24,000-mile warranty on these crazy-built cars. Some clients come to us and start with a Stage 1 package where they might only think they want an extra 100 or 200 horsepower. And honestly, most people that own these vehicles say they're fast enough as they are. What they don't know is what they're missing out on. Then they progressively start stepping up into the higher horsepower packages because they understand what the experience is about and what true enjoyment they can get out of their vehicles by adding more power. The brothers come from a family of racers, so it's no surprise that their hobby grew into a business. Growing up, listening to all the stories from my grandparents, my dad, they used to stop car race, like with A.J. Foyt in Texas, so it just gets it in your blood, and you know, just growing up around that, you kind of just automatically, you just start kind of getting a little bit addicted to it. We would go out on the weekends and street race, and essentially that's where the name Underground Racing came from, was because we actually started from underground street racing. So as we would take our cars out, we would win races, people would see our work, like, wow, your, your car looks beautiful, you know, everything is done so perfectly would you work on my car? So we started working on other people's cars. They would go out, race, win, and more people started bringing their cars, asking us to work on them. So we found uh, our first location. Business was booming, and it's, uh, it's never stopped. One perk of the job is that someone has to test drive the vehicles, and Casey even gets to race them. The owners who want to see their street legal cars break world records. So this car here is a Lamborghini Huracan. Uh, the owner, he wanted to step it up and, uh, and go to 2,000 plus horsepower. Obviously that's a lot to, uh, to jump into and go straight to an event, 
So he asked me to jump in and drive it for him at the event until he had some more seat time. In November, we took it to Sulphur Spring, Texas. There was a want to go fast half mile event. We'd never been to that event before, so it's kind of chilly outside. The conditions weren't the greatest. The runway was kind of dusty, so I really didn't expect any kind of world record. Took just a couple passes the first day, and then the next day it actually warmed up a little bit. Some of the dust from all the cars running kind of cleared off the runway. Casey made, I believe, just one more pass. Once you get up to that starting line, you have to be focused and your mind has to be clear. A lot can happen and you have to be ready to react. A lot of power and a lot of speed. So it can be pretty pretty nerve-wrenching, but when the green light goes on, you have to be ready. And once you cross that finish line, you have to try to stop in time. We're able to achieve 238.6 mile per hour in a standing half mile, which set a brand new half mile world record. After we set the record in this car and I pulled to the pits, the first thing I said was, man, I really love my job. After the break, we meet IndyCar rookie Spencer Piggott and Danica Patrick explains wrecking and drafting at Talladega. Welcome back to Mobile One The Grid. Time now to look at the venue for round four of the Formula One World Championship, the Russian Grand Prix. The Sochi Autodrome is located in the heart of the Olympic Park which hosted the 2014 Winter Olympics. With its mix of high speed and technical sections, the 5.8 kilometer track has become a favorite with McLaren Honda's Jensen Button. The Sochi track, when I actually drove it on the simulator, I found it really difficult to pick out landmarks and what have you, and every corner sort of seems kind of the same. But when you drive it in reality, it's completely different. You know, I love the track. I think it's a great layout. The driving through the Winter Olympic Village is fantastic. I mean, I really enjoy it. The Russian Grand Prix is the last of the early season flyaway races and Button will have high hopes of getting in amongst the points on a Sochi circuit where he's fared well at the previous two events. I've had two reasonably good races there the first year. I was fourth just off the podium. And it's a circuit where the tyres work in a different way to anywhere else in the world. So you can really push the car, you can be aggressive and get away with it. And uh, that's one of the main reasons why I enjoy that track. We're Florida bound now as we meet one of US single-seater racing's brightest prospects. IndyCar this season has seen an influx of young talent keen to take on the old guard. Among the new faces is 22-year-old Spencer Piggott. As 2015 Indy Lights champion, he's earned a scholarship guaranteeing him three races with Ray Hal Letterman Lanigan Racing. The team's credentials are strong. Run by racing legend Bobby Ray Hal, his son Graham took two victories last season to take fourth in the championship. It's fantastic to be a part of this team, you know, they're coming off such a great season last year with Graham and Bobby has won the Indy 500 so there's you know, no one really better to talk to for advice about that race and uh, yeah, we're just really happy to be a part of the team and uh, looking forward to learning as much as I can and hopefully having a long relationship with them. Pickett's journey to IndyCar has a lot to do with the Mazda Road to Indy program, helping young racers rise through the categories with a series of scholarships awarded for the brightest of talent. I've been fortunate, I think I've won four of their scholarships and it's really kept my career going because there were times where you know, it was make or break this season. If we don't win the championship, then you know, I might have to go find something else to do. But winning the scholarship, getting that funding to move up was just, you know, vital. Pickett has made the most of his opportunities with title wins in the Skip Barber National Championship, Pro Mazda, and most importantly, the prestigious Indy Lights crown secured at the final round. The last weekend of the championship, we came in second in the championship and you know, I really had to go out and, and win two races to get it done and we were at Mazda Raceway and I was driving uh, the Mazda scholarship car so you know, being able to win the two races there in the championship was just uh, you know, a feeling I'll never forget. Helping him celebrate his Indy Lights championship were his parents and his father in particular has had a big influence on his career. I got into racing through my dad, he used to race Formula Ford in the 70s and 80s in England against you know Nigel Mansell and Derek Daly and guys like that so he's always been a huge race fan he's always worked in racing and just got my passion from there and started racing cars when I was nine and just uh, been doing it ever since. 
With a limited IndyCar program, Piggott is keen to gain as much racing experience as possible, and he's also been driving some races in Mazda's prototype car in the IMSA WeatherTech Championship. Yeah, it's a very important opportunity as I transition from Indy Lights into IndyCar. This is much similar to IndyCar in terms of the size of the operation. You know, there's a lot of people here. It's a big team. You have pit stops. There's a lot more stuff going on in the car that you have to think about other than just driving. So it's definitely a good learning experience for me to, to hopefully do well in my uh, debut in IndyCar. The rookie's IndyCar career got underway in March's St. Petersburg race. The Florida local took a respectable midfield finish, beating the likes of XF1 driver Max Chilton to the flag. But it's the month of May that he's most looking forward to. I can't wait for the Indy 500. I mean, it's the race I've always wanted to be a part of. I've always loved for as long as I can remember. And, you know, it's just the biggest race in the world. And as an American, there's so much history in the race. It's going to be the 100th running of the race. And to be a part of it is uh, just a dream come true. If Pickett continues to work hard and learn from those around him, perhaps he can go on to emulate one of his heroes from the world of IndyCar and endurance racing. There's a lot of good drivers here that I've watched for a long time. Being an IndyCar fan, Scott Dixon's racing here. He's a four-time champion. And, uh, if I could have a career half as good as his, that'd be pretty neat. My goal is just to do as well as we can. If we can break into the top ten, I think that'd be great. And really just to learn as much as I can and do as well as I can. And hopefully get a few more races this year and you know maybe a full-time season in 2017. We're heading south now to Argentina for round four of the World Rally Championship. The 2016 season had begun with two consecutive wins for world champion Sebastian Ogier. The teammate and rival Yari Mati Latvala hit back at round three in Mexico, and the Finn was looking to continue his resurgence on the famous stages of Argentina. The rally got underway with a super special stage around the streets of Villa Carlos Paz, where Danny Sordo set a blistering pace in the new Hyundai i20. Matched exactly by Ogier and his VW Polo, the two tied for the lead heading into day one proper. And world champion Ogier sped off on the opening 24km gravel stage around the province of Cordoba, passed through the water splashes that the fans love, and setting an unbeatable time. Close behind, Hyundai's Hayden Padden, and Sordo sliding through the water almost sideways. Thierry Neuville, who wrecked his car last year, got a free car wash with the rear door wide open, while the Belgian was outside the leading times. Latvala also failed to finish last season and hit a rock early on this time, but no damage was done and he powered into the lead ahead of Auger and Padden. As championship leader, Auger had to run first on the road on days one and two, meaning he was sweeping the roads for the rest. Hayden Padden was taking full advantage and piling the pressure on the Frenchman, and Latvala continued to be in a class of his own, winning stages seven and eight to confirm his overnight lead. Day two dawned, and with fresh tyres, Auger hadn't given up on Argentina, the only rally on the WRC calendar he hasn't yet won. Hayden Padden has stepped up his pace, risking everything for his maiden WRC victory. But Latvala had a 14 and a half second lead as he hurtled through the Los Gigantes Mountains, and then it all went wrong. The Polo wrecked. Latvala's dream of his first back-to-back -back rally victories was over. And so to the final day in the famous El Condor stage. In fifth place, Matt Osberg was lost in the fog and hit a bank, but a vast crowd meant help was on hand to get him back on his way. Auger, no longer running first on the road, was gunning for victory, and he shaved 30 seconds off Hayden Padden's lead. The New Zealander was feeling the pressure as he misjudged and apexed and stalled his I-20. He would head into the power stage with a lead of just 2.6 seconds. Danny Sordo soared through the power stage but would have to settle for fourth as Mickelson held on to the final podium spot. Auger did his best to wrestle the win from Padden but he couldn't find the speed. The New Zealander would not be denied as he and co-driver John Kennard claimed Hyundai's first win since 2014 and the first ever for the I-20. Padden is also up to second in the World Championship standings as the series moves to Portugal for round five. To end today's Mobile One The Grid, we ask one of NASCAR's favourite drivers for her take on round 10 of the Sprint Cup at Talladega. 
The Geico 500 sees Stock Car Racing's premier category take on the 2.66 mile Talladega track. It's the second race on a super speedway after the season opener at Daytona, and it's guaranteed to be an intense ride for both drivers and fans, as SHR's Danica Patrick explains. Super speedways are <laughs> probably not uh, driver favorites, but I've feel like they're fan favorites and I understand why I mean I've watched NASCAR before I drove in it I know what it's like to have to wait till the very end to know how it's really going to end up and I was leading with 11 laps to go and the yellow comes out and all of a sudden you know you get freight trained and all of a sudden you're 10th or 20th with a couple laps to go it can change so fast uh, that you really just have to finish watching it there are obviously big accidents and it seems like a crapshoot from a driver's perspective a lot of times but uh, you know there's also things that you can do as a driver to limit your negative exposure and put yourself in a good position but I think probably the most helpful thing to doing well on a speedway is to uh, have a lot of experience and have been around a long time because in a stock car what's behind you matters more than what's in front of you That experience not only helps drivers to stay out of trouble, but also to find drafting partners. Because in NASCAR, the super speedways like Talladega are all about slipstreaming. You know, in an Indy car, you're getting a draft off the car in front of you. Uh, but in a stock car, the cars behind you are helping you push. So if we're too wide at Talladega and I get a run and I go to the outside and make it three wide, I might pass three rows, four rows, and move up a bunch. But if I look in my mirror, because I just all of a sudden realized I wasn't going forward anymore, and I don't see anyone behind me because they thought, nah, hang her to dry, she'll go to the back, I get one more spot, you don't go anywhere. So I think it really pays off for drivers that have been around for a long time, um, that other drivers trust them, and, you know, you pull out to go to the front, then other drivers go, He's going to the front or she's going to the front, I'm going with. Uh, so experience pays off on the speedways. Next time, we talk to Porsche's number one team and join Miko Hervenen in the desert. Meanwhile, join us on YouTube, Twitter, and at mobile1thegrid.com for exclusive motorsport features and the very best writers on the web. MobileOneTheGrid.com is your home of motorsport online. See you next time.